Hi and welcome. So this time around, we're going to take a look at a new purchase I made. The Harbor Freight 20 ton shop press. And after discount or sale price, it was 149 bucks. And I made some improvements to it and I just thought I'd uh, share them with you in case you end up with one of these. Because a real uh, 20 ton press like a Dake would be about a thousand bucks. So for those of us who can't afford them, we're forced to go with the uh, notably inferior version of the Harbor Freight design that actually used a bottle jack rather than a hydraulic piston. But uh, there are some improvements that can be made that'll make it a lot easier to use and I'll share with you what I have found. Let's start off with the, uh, the metal pieces that you press against. These things are slicker than snot. As you can see, they just skate along here. And the first thing you do is as you're trying to adjust something, they fall right off and if you're not careful, right on your toe. So the first mod I made as recommended my brother-in-law was some way to keep them captive. I drilled four holes, the width of the, uh, the width of the, uh, the shortest width of the spacing between the cross piece. And now they can't fall out, but they do slide. And since I did it in a square pattern, you can rotate so that I can use any of the features on these guys. So the left side's a little tighter than the right side, but it does uh, make it, I, I drilled it a little close. Also, I drilled holes all the way through rather than make blind holes. And that was in case one of the pins gets damaged or bent, I can knock it out. If there were blind holes, they'd be much harder to get out. So these are hardened dowel pins. I drilled and reamed them for about one and a half thousandths undersized, so they're, they're pressed in equal, equal depth. And to do the equal depth, I used my arbor press. And while I was pressing them, I just took another piece of metal that was the depth I want, set it next to the pin, pressed it until they touched. And that was that. Next up is the hydraulic press itself. And it's functional, but it moves almost not at all for each pump of this guy. That's how they're getting the massive uh, 20 ton advantage with just this little tiny lever. So uh, what I've done is I spent almost an equal amount on the 20 ton hydraulic jack at Harbor Freight that included an air, uh, an air motor that pumps the hydraulic fluid so that you can do rapid changes. So you want to get the uh, six inch travel, this six inch travel close to whatever it is you're going to work on. Uh, that would take a lot of pumps, probably like 50 or so I'm guessing. Uh, so the air uh, motor should speed that up. The nice thing is that this jack is about the same size as the air motor jack. So they should just be direct replacements. Let me uh, just pop it over and see if I can swap it so out. The old jack is just sitting here in place. The top of the jack fits into this round relief. They uh, just a piece of pipe they welded into the top. And all you need to do is push down on these return springs and this guy slides right out. Now the new guy is the same width. It has return springs built in and uh, we will remove those because we'll use the exterior ones, even though these would fit just fine, but we're going to remove those. Um, it actually might make a cleaner design kind of interesting because those are really tight and these are farther over. It would clear the space, but you know, I don't think it really matters. I think we will leave these springs in place because they've got a fairly good adjustment range if you want to make it tighter for more return. Uh, so we'll leave those, we'll leave these alone, remove the other ones. We're going to pop this jack out. This guy is going to go in. The kit came with a really worthless set of handles like all of their jacks do. They really suck. They, uh, you know, the one piece locks into the other but falls out constantly. Uh, this valve is kind of a pain in the ass to use. And uh, this also supports manual and air mode. So all I needed to do to remove the springs was just stretch them a little bit and they popped right off, no problem. The top plate is just sitting here, so that's easy to remove. Nice heavy gauge quarter inch melt bent steel. And uh, they even relieved the inside so it uh, fits very nicely. They did a nice job on this one. It's interesting that they went to more effort on this jack than their other jacks. By the way, the normal 20 ton jack, like the one in here, sells for about 
39 bucks, I think. And you get a 20 per, if you get a 20% coupon or 25% coupon, it's going to be even less. Kind of crazy. That would put it down to like, you know, 30 bucks or so. 32 bucks. Uh, this is just a standard jack with an adjustable height. It's too bad I couldn't have this bit on the bottom. They're nice Acme threads. And that would be really handy. Uh, the high quality hydraulic piston jacks have a piece like this on the bottom that lets you adjust this to touch the work. Unfortunately, this is on the top, so I don't get to take advantage of that. So here's the new hydraulic jack in place with the air motor in back. And all of the force is going to be straight down on the bottle itself, which is right over the, where you want it to be. So it's a good fit. Only difference was this guy's a little bit taller by about half an inch to an inch. I didn't measure closely, uh, just had to uh, stretch the springs a little more to get it in place. So now with the throttle in place. You have much more rapid motion. So next up, we don't want to have to use the back of the manual handle to release the jack. So, I mean, the, yeah, the bottle jack. So what we're going to do is we're going to make a knob that's going to fit on here that'll slide over the central shaft, uh, key in with the pin they've got in here, and uh, um, lock to it with the set screw. This bit here is going to be the knob, and the dimensions are all purely for, by my aesthetic. So. There's no critical sizes here. I think this would be about enough. I actually had this piece of cold rolled that had this little bit turned down. So I'm gonna keep turning that down till it looks like it should be about the right shaft diameter. I don't know, maybe inch or three quarters of an inch. So uh, we're just gonna do this free form and uh, try and get uh, an appropriate dimensions that I like, that I find aesthetically pleasing. just setting some zero points here so if I consider this my zero point I can work towards that so let's try uh, 50 thousandths depth of cut 7 thousandths of revolution rpm will be 440 at the start see how that works out <laughs> Kind of ugly. Let's try a bigger bike. That was pretty easy. 100,000 steps to cut. Chip breaker is engaging. The surface finish improved a bit, too. This is 75,000 depth of cut, same feed rate. The velocity is a lot lower because the diameter is smaller and it really doesn't like it as you can tell by the finish. So here's a different style cutter. And we're gonna try a really slow feed rate with this guy.
nowhere near as good as the vertical shear cutter. Better than the other one, but still not great. And this is not a precision <laughs> size at all. Oh, I went over a little bit. Because, again, I just chose this dimension so that I could uh, put this part in a collet to when I flip it around, if I want to, a uh, 5C collet. Alrighty, I think that should be good. <laughs> I'd almost parted this off before I drilled this hole. That would have been kind of silly. So I flipped the uh, knob around, or knob to be around, and I put it in my uh, collet chuck. That's why I chose 3 quarter inch. It's convenient. I knew I had a collet for it, so that's what I'm doing. So now, I just want to get the thickness down to something I like the look of. So we're going to try a 75,000th depth of cut and just see how it works. I'm cutting a dish on the inside and then I'll knurl the outside. Originally I was going to cut scallops in it but I, I changed my mind as I often do as sort of the design evolves since this is all decorative anyways. So let's see if we get a better finish at 1100 RPM. I'm going to dig in just a couple of thousands really light cut. Let's see how this one works. Oh, that kind of appears to be doing a better job. So I'm like only a couple thousand steps of cut 1100 RPM. I kind of like that finish. Locking the z-axis travel for longitudinal. So, still not perfect. This cold rolled uh, really doesn't want to behave itself, but uh, I can barely feel the grooves. So, a little bit of sanding, light sanding, it should look all right. That's a really nice deep knurl. That'll be great. Great grip. And I think I'm just going to bring the chamfering cutter out one more time. And I, I did a little bit of extra damage to this side. It's also not symmetrical. And I think the height of this was not exactly right. And that's why. But this will still work great. I always talk about how order of operations is important. And uh, here I've gone and made that very mistake. So I knurled the outside edge, yet I have to clamp this in the vise here, which means that I've got to risk damaging the knurling, or if I use soft material, it's risk being embedded in the knurling. So that really wasn't thinking too far ahead on my part. Uh, I should have waited to do the knurling as a last step, because I can always grab by the three-quarter inch shaft. I just figured since I had it there, why not? But uh, that wasn't thinking too far ahead. So uh, let's get this guy in here so we can cut our slot. Since this is by no means a precision operation, I just dropped my center in here, held it down, tightened the vise, good to go with the part in place. And uh, again, the slot, not a precision operation, so no need to be uh, bring out the coaxial indicator because we don't need to be that precise. So I'd like to point out that I've had really terrible luck with these tiny carbide uh, eighth inch cutters. They come in packs of 10. You kind of need them. They break so easily. So uh, we got to go high RPMs on this guy because that's what they need. We're going to run the mill.
4,200 RPM. And I think depth of cut wise, we're just gonna go light. We're gonna start with 15,000 depth of cut here, power feed. Try another 15. If I don't break one this time, it'll be the first time I've ever used these without breaking one. So we're doing 25,000 steps ahead of right now. Oh. And there was. I just pushed it a tiny bit, boom, breaks. Got the slot. Next up, drill and tap for a set screw. So let's uh, go over to the uh, hydraulic press and see what it looks like. Here's the knob in place, uh, works well. Uh, the set screw probably wasn't necessary because they did such a poor job making the shaft that it is tapered and so the knob got tight before it was all the way in anyway so I tapped uh, the rest of the way and uh, tighten the set screw but probably wasn't necessary so next step is to make a better handle than the craptastic one that came with it I had a spare piece of stainless that I made to shape and it's a little bit larger in diameter than the hole so I just made a fit it's a bit heavy uh, it works fine and it's nice looking but uh, I think there uh, could be a better solution so I'm going to try some hollow aluminum instead. So version 2.0 handle right here, made out of aluminum, thick walled, fits nice and snug, not too snug, but uh, easy pumping, very light, so it doesn't fall out on its own. I was originally considering putting a pin in here or putting a little knob with a thread on here to keep this thing in, but it actually uh, it actually doesn't fall out even when it's all the way down. It's, it's pretty good. All right, so next up, see if we can do something about stopping these pins from popping out. So my solution to keep the pins from popping out is I took them out, drilled and tapped them quarter 20, and I'm making a set of these caps that I'll put a bolt through and lock tight in place and I will screw these over the end. They don't have to be particularly strong. All they have to do is stop this from sliding and by pulling against this on both sides. So I've got to make four of these. I've already made one just to test it out. Uh, let's go over to the lathe here where you can see that I've prepped my material. I have drilled all the way through to depth uh, a tap drill and I just need to take each one of these now and I need to uh, bore it out to eight tenths of an inch wide, quarter inch deep, uh, part off the uh, tool, uh, part off the part, and uh, on to the next one. So first step uh, to, to boring this out is I have to get a hole big enough for my boring tool to fit in and the little uh, number seven drill bit in the middle is not big enough. So I'm gonna take a half inch end mill so I can get a flat bottom and I'm gonna use the DRO on my tailstock that I made in another project, then you can check that out if you're interested. Very useful tool, I use it all the time. And so, uh, use the DRO on my tailstock, and we're just gonna go in the quarter inch. I mean, it's not a critical depth or anything. This is not a precision part by anything, any means, but I'd like to get it uh, pretty close. two flukes instead of a four flukes so that I can get better chip clearance for the aluminum. The other solution, by the way, there is another solution other than this one, and uh, that solution would involve taking a half inch drill bit and taking it to the grinder and grinding it flat across here and then adding a little back relief for each cutting edge and then you know sharpening sharpening that edge make sure it's back sharp but you can make flat bottom drill bits as well um, anyways just in, just pointing out there so now we're going to bore this the remaining uh, three tenths of an inch so i set my depth so i originally was going to set this to zero but i thought it's easier to count down to zero so i went all the way in since the uh, boring bar fits and set my zero there. 
I also set my inside zero, so now we're going to just go to 0.8. Seventy-seven thousand. Mm -hmm. Go to full depth this time. I was a couple thousand shy before. There we go, and we're done. Now we just need to chamfer the inside, chamfer the outside, and part it. Yes, inside. Comes the outside. Now we part it. Almost forgot a step, still have to tap it. <laughs> Next step, came over 0 0.640. Next step is just to part it. Amazing what a difference lube makes to the, uh, the sticking of the chips inside. I went the first time dry. They didn't want to clean the lube off just to see. It makes a huge difference on this particular material with this cutter. That's it. Rinse and repeat. So far I've made three of these and I'm on my fourth and uh, just wanted to point out another thing that changed in my thought process and each step I was trying to think if I was actually trying to manufacture these and create a bunch of these how would I speed up this process so I thought first okay I should drill all the way through all the parts if I can uh, ha if I have a drill bit long enough uh, that would save me time changing tools uh, then when I was parting it, I noticed, oh, why am I only relieving one side? Even though I'm going to face this, I'll just over relieve this a little bit, face it, and I'll have the right relief on that side. Uh, so I'm trying to do multiple steps at one time so I don't have to change tools because it slows you down. And uh, I'd love to hear from the guys that do it for a living because for them, time is money. For me, it's a hobby and I can afford to make mistakes that uh, cost me time. Anyways, just something to think about uh, while you're making these things. I thought it was kind of interesting. So here's the final product. These button screw heads don't go flush, so I'm going to have to do something about that, but temporarily this will do the job. Just thread them on there, don't need to be tight. The only, job, the only point of these is to stop the bar from being able to slide out, which it does. So that's perfect. Finally, I've got to put a couple hold downs here because this guy's loose and it drives me nuts. The only thing that happens when it's loose is that it just rotates because the uh, the piston is located by this little exposed piece of pipe that they welded to the top. So it can't move, it's just annoying. So it's either that or I drill and tap and put like a spacer in this corner that would locate it and it really couldn't go anywhere because it can't. And then also they're counting the fact that once you put pressure on this by pumping it up, it can't go anywhere either because uh, now friction is going to hold this against this because this, obviously you're going to have up to 20 tons force. All right, let's uh, figure out the next step. Here are all the changes I've made in summation. Uh, number one and biggest change is I replaced the jack. Um, this one has an air motor attached right here, and that allows the piston to be uh, extended much more rapidly. Uh, number two, these guys, slicker than snot, had nothing to keep them on the crossbar. So I drilled and reamed for pins, captive pins, 
and the pins prevent, they allow it to slide, but they can't pop out. And since there are four of them, I can choose any of these four directions and I can use any of the, uh, the cutouts that they've already provided. Next, I made the pins captive and they're easy enough to re remove. I just put these little uh, aluminum discs, I drilled and tapped both ends of the pins so that uh, they can't come off because I found one off twice. As you can see, they slide very easily, slicker than snot. So front and back, and I just loosen one side, pop the pin and change the height. Since that's not something you're doing all the time, that won't be a problem. I replaced the cheesy bar that came with it with a new one that is fairly thick walled aluminum. And last but not least, I put two little centering things that keep the jack from rotating too much. I think I'm not particularly happy with these design. I just had these pieces lying around, so I thought, ah, oh, what the heck. Uh, so I think I want a clamp design, so that's probably gonna be a future thing. Oh, also, another big improvement, I put a knob on the release for the jack. And that makes it really easy when you're trying to, you know, sitting here, dialing a part in. Oh, that's not quite right. Dial it in. Not quite right. So, made it very easy. And uh, I know that this is not a dake <laughs> by any stretch, but I made it a lot more usable a jack. So, uh, uh, any more ideas I come up with in the future, I'll share with you. And uh, thanks for watching. Hope you found it interesting and hope this uh, might have helped you make a Harbor Freight Jack, uh, I mean, uh, hydraulic press more useful for you if you're interested and we're looking that direction. I mean, the list price I think is something like $189. I got on sale for $149. The Jack goes for $119, I think, and you get a 20% off coupon, drops it down to about $99. So you're looking at $200 and change into it, which is not terrible considering it's a 20-ton press uh, with a fairly decent capacity. So thanks for watching. Hope you found it useful. Hope to see you next time.